owning a business is uh, the true American dream. It's not for everyone and it's not easy. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, but it's a, uh, it's the preferred lifestyle for me. Setting up an entity does not mean that you're, you know, that you're in business. It's amazing how many small business owners don't know where their numbers are. Welcome to the Zero to Profitable Franchise Podcast, the best place for you to come to figure out the right franchise to buy and how to get and stay profitable. My name is Tark Johnson, and I've bought, grown, and sold multiple franchises and got myself free from corporate America, and now I'm on a mission to help you do that too. Here you'll find some of the most in-depth, profitable franchise secrets, tangible strategies, and specific mindsets to help you create your dream life through franchising. Have you ever heard that the IRS tax code was designed for business owners and not employees? Well, I can tell you from my personal experience that I feel like that's true. The tax breaks and opportunities for you to save tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes as an entrepreneur are there waiting for you. And in this episode, I talked to Michael Reeder, who is a franchise industry CPA, meaning his business is specifically about helping franchise owners with their tax and accounting needs for their businesses. So we talk about two of the most common things that Michael gets asked about, which is, One, how do I choose the right business entity? And two, how do I choose the right funding? So we also dive into topics like qualifying for a mortgage once you are a franchisee and entrepreneur and how that works and how you need to prepare yourself today to put yourself in the right position, as well as how retirement accounts work as an entrepreneur and franchise owner in a way that you could put $58,000 a year into your retirement account. So I know that taxes aren't the sexiest topic, But if you like keeping more money in your pocket and less in the governments, then this episode is for you. So make sure to stay until the end because we cover the most exciting topics at the end of this podcast. Now, this episode is not sponsored by anyone. So if you're wanting to buy a franchise in the next 12 months, you should check out my free franchise masterclass at buyaprofitablefranchise.com. And if you want to work with me and my team on finding or buying a franchise or resale business, then you can go to tarkjohnson.com slash consulting, and we're happy to see if we can help. With that said, let's jump into episode number five of the Zero to Profitable Franchise Podcast. All right, everyone. I, today, we got a special one. I'm here with uh, Michael Reeder, who's a, a CPA and the managing shareholder over at Swartz and Reeder Advisors. Uh, Michael and I have connected a few times, and I just thought, wow, I, I really... Uh, need to have him on because what he helps people with is something that's a a major topic and very important to business owners. Uh, So Michael, thanks for uh, thanks for the time and coming on. Hey, Tarek, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So just to start out, tell, um, tell everyone a little bit about yourself and and you know what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm a CPA out of the greater Chicago area. Um, the name of my firm is Swartz and Reader Advisors. We are a CPA firm for small businesses and individuals working with clients locally and nationwide. And over the last six plus years, I've, I've developed a niche uh, as a franchise industry CPA. Um, and I'm an entrepreneurial CPA. Um, I bought, uh, I've bought businesses myself and uh, I, I fell in love with it so much that I now help other aspiring entrepreneurs all across the country um, uh, better prepare for their own business purchases. Um, And so I've I've developed a process uh, as a franchise CPA. I've I've developed a nationwide network of uh, franchise consultants, uh, franchise development teams, franchisors, and franchise funding companies. And I have a a great nationwide network of referral partners um, that, that send me uh, uh, their, their buying candidates whenever their buying candidate wants to talk to a franchise industry CPA. And, uh, and, and I have my free CPA consultation call where I provide a free 60 minute uh, CPA consultation call to these buyers. Um, and so, you know, like that's what we'll get into on this call. But um, uh, I, I love what I do. Um, you know, I mean, in my opinion, owning a business is uh, the true American dream. It's not for everyone. And it's not easy. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, but it's a it's the preferred lifestyle for me, and uh, it's and, and it's a lifestyle that a lot of people out there uh, strive to have for themselves. And, um, and and I strive to provide value to them as a franchise industry CPA, uh, preparing them 
for business ownership from the perspective of accounting, taxes, entity structure, funding, et cetera. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, uh, that debrief on what you do and who you serve. And uh, Michael had reached out to me on LinkedIn uh, a while back, a couple months ago, and uh, my inbox, as probably most do, get blown up on LinkedIn uh, with people uh, hitting them up. And I literally never respond back to people. And, you know, I, I had... I've had so many clients and non-clients of people who just follow the YouTube channel reach out to me and ask me, well, what entity should I set up? And what, you know, what should I, what should I do for, for taxes or this and that? And um, I am so, you know, there's so much general advice out there. And I always, uh, I hate when people ask me very specific questions to their situation where it's like, I can't help you because I don't know enough about your situation. Um, but uh, hopefully we can kind of dive in and, and break some of the confusion that that exists out there. So let's start with, you know, with really kind of topic number one, which I'd say is is entity. And I'll, I'll preface with that when one here here's the thing: a lot of people confuse setting up an entity for actually making significant progress towards their business goal and dream right? Because there's people that sometimes set up an entity and they're like, I own a business now. <laughs> so, Like having just an entity with no like revenue or anything like that um, is, is not technically really owning, uh, owning a business. But let's, let's talk about that a little bit because people talk about, uh, should I start an LLC? Should I start a C-Corp? So, you know, different things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the the benefits of creating an entity overall, as opposed to just owning a business in your personal name? Absolutely. Great question, Tark, and thank you. Um, and just to take one step back and set the table really quick, when I have these free CPA consultation calls with buyers, they're 60 minutes. And uh, the purpose of the call is for me to answer any questions the buyers have in the context of accounting, tax, entity structure, funding, financial projections, resale, financial statement, due diligence, if applicable, if it's a resale, uh, or item 19 of the FDD uh, and or item 21 of the FDD as it pertains to the candidate's uh, um, business uh, investigation and investment. And with all that being said, the, um, the topic of entity structure and funding are the two most commonly discussed topics on the consultation calls. Um, and so entity structure, like, like to your point, Tarek, like just setting up an entity does not mean that you're, you know, that you're in business, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not that difficult. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, all this like massive amounts of revenue is going to pour through the doors. It's much, uh, there's much more to that. Um, but uh, for sure, like, so number, like, so entity structure, whether someone sets up, at, like, yeah, you know, I get questions all the time, you know, hey, Mike, should I be you know, should I set up as an LLC or an S corp or a C corp or a partnership, uh, sole proprietorship, and why? Like, hey, Mike, I heard that I should be this because of X, Y, or Z, or Mike, I heard I should be that because of X, Y, or Z. And so, I, I definitely lean into entity structure and funding as the most two commonly discussed topics on the consultation calls. And so, to answer your question, Tarek, um, so not so the reason why someone would want to structure an entity that has its own separate uh, federal employer identification number, AKA uh, tax ID number, separate from their, um, their social security number is mainly from a liability perspective. So I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm a CPA, I'm the tax guy, um, but anyone will tell you um, that it's always good practice to set up your entity with a tax ID number separate from your social for liability purposes, to keep, to, to, to establish that separation, that degree of separation between you, the individual and your business. Um, and to set up uh, and then, you know, God forbid, if there were ever anything going on with the business where there were, you know, where there was a plaintiff, you know, that was that was suing your business as the defendant you know, and, and your yeah. business as the defendant, you know, cr cr uh, creditors pursuing your business, trying to file a judgment. If there was any way that they could pierce the LLC veil or the corporate veil and pursue your uh, personal assets, then that's always bad news. So that's not necessarily really a, a tax reason. It's not really a tax, more of a liability thing as to why it's always good practice to have your business in a entity separate from you, 
individually with its own identification number that's not your social security number. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for breaking that down. And what what are some of the benefits from a tax perspective in terms of having an entity and, and different either write-offs that may be available or uh, different uh, tax strategies that someone may be able to utilize you know, simply by having the separation between entities? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So um, as I always tell people, the Internal Revenue Code is written for the self-employed. It's written for the business owner out there compared to, for example, uh, that person who is just a uh, corporate W-2 employee. And what I mean by that, so first and foremost, uh, the difference between those two taxpayers, right? Like number over here, like the self-employed business owner versus the corporate W-2 employee. Um, the the self-employed business owner can write off all of his or her business expenses. So anything that's a business expense reduces the bottom line. If you're just a corporate W-2, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with being a corporate W-2 employee, right? Like, again, like, like the more that, People talk to me like they realize I'm very big on, you know, weighing the pros and cons of everything, right? Pros of being a corporate W-2 is, uh, um, you know, you have benefits, uh, you know, maybe you can just like, you know, work from nine to five and then turn the work switch off, you know, from one entrepreneur to another, Tarek, you know, that like oftentimes that switch doesn't go off. We, we got to, we got to always try it our best, but it's not the nine to five. Um, but uh, so, you know, being able to, as a, like when you have an entity, whether it's structured as an S corp, an LLC, a C corp, any business expenses, you can write off dollar for dollar to reduce the amount of income that's subject to income tax for your entity. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, if if uh, there there like if you're structured as an S corporation, there is a, a potential to save money in what's in a tax that's called self-employment taxes. Now, self-employment taxes are different than income tax. Self-employment tax is another word for social security and Medicare tax. So if you're structured as a sole, if you're taxed as a sole proprietorship um, or a partnership, then all of the net income from those types of entities is subject both to income tax and self-employment tax. If you're structured as an S corporation, then you can control the way you pay yourself to only pay um, the self-employment tax on a piece of the profit as opposed to all of it. If you're taxed as a C corporation, um, there, uh, if you want to take money out, uh, you could take money out either as salary or dividends. Um, and there are, uh, there is this unique structure in the, in the franchise and business resale world that I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this uh, episode have heard of, but if not, um, you know, like we, we all try to, you know, like it, it's an opportunity to learn something new, but, uh, it's called the Rob's program, the rollover as a business startup. And that's a structure that requires you to be a C corporation. And it's essentially a self-directed 401k. It's a way for you to, to use your retirement assets for your business now. And, uh, there are, there are certain, you know, there are pros and cons of that structure as well. Um, but, you know, uh, I would say that the main, like the, the key, the key value prop of being structured, uh, of being self-employed um, and, and having an entity uh, separate from yourself personally uh, is number one, the ability to just write off all your business expenses to reduce your, your, your taxable income. And, um, and then, uh, and then, and then getting back to that, that, that topic of liability, doing it in a separate entity with a separate tax ID number. So um, any sort, so you're protected from a liability perspective. So anyone can't go after you. Now there are ways to pierce the veil, and we can always talk about that. You know, you have to be able to. You have to make sure that you uh, don't commingle your books, and you keep your corporation or LLC in good standing with the Secretary of State each year. Um, but those are the main. Those are the main things to take into consideration as to like the you know, um, the benefit of, of having your business in a separate entity that's not your social security number. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for breaking that down. And yeah, there, I know that, you know, my wife and I, we've experienced a lot of benefits uh, with, we have multiple businesses and my wife has been an entrepreneur uh, for much longer than I have. And I remember her business crushing it. And uh, because of a massive renovation project she had done in her building, she had this carryover loss that she was able to utilize every year because she did a very, very significant size renovation project on a, a commercial building that she owned where her business was. And it was just like, hold on, what? We're not, we're not having to pay any taxes. This is, 
crazy and it benefited us both. Uh, and what would happen was me because of being a W2 employee and having taxes set aside and then her carryover loss, basically what would happen was everything that I paid in, we'd wind up getting back as, you know, as a refund. And so um, there are just so many advantages uh, to being a business owner. And then you start talking about things like depreciation and being able to leverage depreciation in your business. So uh, certainly something to think about when you're looking to make the leap from employee to entrepreneur, if you still have a job while you have your business, there's ways, especially when you have a professional that a, a professional, you know, like Mike and his firm can help you strategize in, in making the most sense, you know, out of your situation. Now let's pivot to this topic, uh, which is, and, and I want to talk, there's two things that I want to cover. One of the things I do want to talk a little bit about retirement plans. And I know we didn't, we didn't talk about this, but I know you'll be able to, uh, to provide some value there. But before we do, here's a mistake that I made when I, when, when we opened and bought our first franchise location was I was like doing our own income statements and I had no formal training in creating a profit and loss statement. I was using the franchisor's kind of spreadsheet model template, wasn't doing anything through QuickBooks. One, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, although I'm pretty decent with numbers. Two, I spent hours and hours and hours going through the transactions on the business account, putting them into the spreadsheet, creating the profit and loss statement, and I just thought I was so smart and so like, you know, such a cool guy for doing my own profit and loss statements. And then a couple of years later, I realized how much of an idiot I was for doing that. And so one, it's really not that expensive to have someone do your books, generally speaking. Um, uh, two, you want to make sure you have a professional doing it. So Mike, can you talk about what, what can, for the novice who has no idea what a financial statement even is, what is a profit and loss? What's a balance sheet? Why is it so important to the business? Absolutely. So a profit and loss statement is a financial statement that shows your, your operating revenue and your operating expenses and your operating profit. So income and expenses are shown on the profit and loss statement, AKA the income statement. The balance sheet is a financial statement that shows a snapshot in time. So uh, the, so back to the, in, the, the profit and loss statement really quick, that's from like a range uh, like that's from, you know, January 1st of the year to December 31st of the year and the revenue and expenses for that 12 month period. It can be any period, but it's usually, you know, um, a range of, 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 uh, of several months or a year. Uh, a balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So like as of 1231 of year one or as of July 31st of whatever. Uh, it's, it's just a snapshot in time of your assets, your company's assets, liabilities, and equity. Um, and equity, you know, uh, so the, your assets are, um, you know, like how much equity do you have in your assets and, and how much are your, are your assets leveraged by third-party debt? So that's what the balance sheet shows you. Uh, then there's also another statement called the statement of cash flows, which, uh, which shows the different cash flows of your business. So there's operating cash flows, financing cash flows, and investing cash flows. Um, and so, but let's focus like to your point, Tark, the, the, the two main ones to focus on are income statement, you know, AKA profit and loss and balance sheet. And why they're important is because as, 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 as to all you viewers out there, as I'm sure you've heard the cliche as a small business owner, you want, you want to know where your numbers are and it's true. And, but, but, and while that's true, it's amazing how many small business owners don't know where their numbers are. It's amazing how many small business owners uh, make day-to-day -day business decisions based on uh, just logging into their business bank account and seeing how much is in the bank account and making decisions from there, as opposed to looking at, you know, a perpetually updated set of financial statements, like an income statement and a balance sheet, um, you know, income statement synonymous with profit and loss statement. Um, and so, uh, you, the, by, uh, and so they're important for business owners because they really, the, the income statement and the balance sheet always really do as a business owner, let you know where your numbers are. See, are you, are you making money or are you losing money? If you're making money, how much are you making? Um, you know, uh, what assets do you have? What debt do you have? 
how do you have to allocate that profit? Do you have to allocate a chunk of it to servicing debt? Are you in a position to, to take distributions as a, as a shareholder of the business? Uh, do you have to reinvest in the company? How much do you have to reinvest? Uh, you know, where are you overspending? Where are like, uh, where are you overspending? You know, like your bank account's not, like if you just like log into your bank account on, on, a, on any given day, you're not gonna know that you're overspending in advertising or you're overspending in office supplies. Uh, but if you have a perpetually updated profit and loss statement, and and you have um, you have ratios of the expense category totals as a um, um, as 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 a ratio of gross revenue. You can see well mm -hmm, this tends to be higher than industry. I shouldn't be spending this much in this specific expense account. Or wow, did we really blow that much in meals and entertainment last month? Holy smokes! Like when you see it, you know. So the financial statements, as opposed to just logging into your bank account, tell the whole story tell the whole story and really allow you as the business owner to make decisions. Uh, you know, and so my advice to business owners is to really like, what, like one of the first things that you do when you get, when you get in business is to get, is to, to work with a professional, to work with a CPA like myself, to really take your books seriously. So I'm a big fan of QuickBooks online. So get a QuickBooks online account for your business and get the chart of accounts set up and, 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 and there, you know, it's 2021. So like, and, and we're only moving forward into the future. So, you know, a lot of things when it comes to the bookkeeping, just like anything, like uh, when it comes to bookkeeping, utilize automation and technology as much as possible to not only make the books as accurate as possible, but also to uh, eliminate all of this time. Like Tark, you were saying how, like when you first started out, you know, you spent hours and hours doing it yourself. And, um, you know, like uh, uh, leveraging automation and technology, like syncing the business bank accounts to the QuickBooks online accounts, syncing the business credit card accounts, syncing the payroll processing software to the QuickBooks online. All of that stuff, like it, 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 it allows the books to be done with a high degree of accuracy as well as as efficiently as possible. And to do all of that and to view the books, to view the company's books as not just this thing that has to get done at the last minute to give to your CPA so he or she can file the taxes, but as, as a, a, to, but to view the books as, a, as an internal management tool. Like, yeah. the, like if, if, if your books are updated, then of course it's going to make tax time easier because then you just pass the books over to your accountant. Day. But then also if your books are perpetually updated, then you can also have that proactive tax planning conversation with your accountant, not just, uh, oh, here are my books to file last year's taxes, but beyond taxes, whether it's actually filing taxes and tax planning to actually look at the books and have a CFO related conversation with your accountant to actually look at the cash flow of the business and make management decisions. You know, what can we do to increase profit? Because everyone out there, we all know we have to file our taxes and all, and everyone wants to do whatever they can to save money in taxes and, and, and be proactive with tax strategies. But at the end of the day, business owners care about making money. That's what really opens up listening. That's what really people are interested in. And like people know that they got to do this tax thing. And, and, you know, my firm is a great resource for all things taxes, but we're also a great resource, you know, uh, in that capacity of that fractional CFO. So it's like, yes, taxes are important, but let's look at the books and say, okay, how can we increase revenue? Where can we decrease expenses? How can we increase profit? And so that's not really a tax conversation. Of course, taxes are part of it, but you know, in conclusion, to really take the bookkeeping seriously, because if the books are perpetually updated, then it then it makes that tax conversation streamlined. It makes that CFO conversation streamlined and a big. And if you don't, if 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 the and it's amazing how many business owners out there, you know, don't you know, like are like fall into this category of they procrastinate on their books then it makes those conversations difficult. If you don't have a, 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 a sound bookkeeping system, if your books are not updated and accurate, then it makes the whole tax conversation almost impossible to have. And it makes that uh, CFO conversation almost impossible to have. So like the books are the foundation of the company's internal controls and they're very important. And, and, and understand that from day one. That's advice that I give to every business owner out there. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great advice. And here's here's what what I'll say very clearly and directly. Um, if you as a business owner are not hiring someone else, 
hiring a firm, tax accounting firm to do your books, you're wasting your time and you're making being a business owner uh, harder on yourself. Usually it's not very expensive. Uh, uh, depending upon the complexity of your situation, it can be as cheap as a few hundred dollars a month sometimes. And so to spend hours trying to figure things out and even spend time in QuickBooks, I think is a complete waste of time. And think about from an entrepreneur, what your value is in making decisions and growing your business. If you're spending even a few, uh, an hour to a week on trying to figure out stuff with your books, that's time wasted that you're not spending on your business. And, you know, I, that was really very insightful around the tax planning standpoint. You know, I can't reiterate this enough as, uh, as someone who for a couple of years didn't really have those things in order. And now, you know, it's funny, I was just, I was just talking to my wife about this and, and uh, saying that in, we have weekly family meetings, me and my wife, so that we can plan our life as a couple and as entrepreneurs and vacations and our family life. Um, and so I said, hey, you know, we need to also start having monthly meetings where we share our business P&Ls with each other so that we can be on the same page uh, and balance sheets uh, so that we can be on the, the same page on where each other's businesses are at, how they're performing, and so we can plan. Because as an example, we set a plan and a target that in, at the, in 2023, we are going to buy uh, our dream home. And so in order to do that, that takes planning. And we need to make sure that we're not just like having a bunch of write-offs. I've seen this, and I'm sure you have too, where people, they're great at getting write-offs, but what happens? They're so great at write-offs and depreciation that they show such little profit, and then it can be very challenging getting a loan. So there's ways that you have to plan around that. And so I'm already thinking ahead going, okay, well, we need to make sure that we're setting ourselves up and showing enough profit and not just crushing it with write-offs so that once we're ready to pull the trigger, it makes it very easy from a lending perspective to get approved. Uh, that is, you know, that's a, that's a mic drop right there because, <laughs> <laughs> because there, um, uh, and especially, and so um, the, re like I've learned both through my own refinance and real estate purchases and also working with my clients, um, the residential, uh, the residential real estate underwriting process for, for getting a mortgage is uh, it was already difficult for self-employed people compared like if you're just a w-2 and you're trying to get a house uh the, you just need to provide the lender with you know two years of, of tax returns and w-2s and your and, and and two months of your personal bank account statements and and two months of check stubs and you're done um uh but if you're self and, and covid made it even harder for self-employed so if you want to get a res if you want to get approved for a mortgage and you're self-employed then you're going to have to submit a uh, prior two years of tax returns, as well as W-2s and K-1s, um, and then also a current year uh, interim financial statement. So like if, if Tark and his wife are applying for a mortgage now, they're going to have to supply 2020 and 2019 tax returns. And, and you know, like, let's just assume that like, you know, it's August 31st right now. So then also interim eight-month P&Ls for um, uh, the first eight months of 21. And then those P&Ls are also going to have to be uh, supplemented by uh, – uh, two or three months of the business bank statements as well. And so what they do is they take a 24 month average from the prior two year tax returns, and then your current year financials, uh, that the, the monthly cash flow from the, the current year financials have to be at or exceed that 24 month average from the prior two years from the tax returns. And it has to be trending within those two, the two most recent months that are supplemented by bank statements. So if you're, if you're, um, if your average, if your average cash flow from the 24 months was like, you know, 10,000, you know, if there, if, if, and then if you were to uh, submit your financial statements for the eight months of 2021, and they were trending in at uh, 9,000, you would have like, you would have a problem, like your self-employed income would be at risk of not 
qualifying towards the the, the debt to income ratio that you would need to get approved for the mortgage. So it's uh, COVID only made it worse for self-employed borrowers from a residential lending perspective. And so that's why you really have to think about this stuff like yours, like the fact that you and your wife, Tark are having these monthly meetings. Yeah. You have to position yourself to get, to get pre-approved for that mortgage for your dream house. Um, because if you don't uh, you know, like there's like, you could, you know, like you could, you could really, you know, you could like, so, a hundred percent. It takes like, it's not, it's, it's much more easier to just in that context, it's easier to just be sell to just be corporate employee, you know, just W2s, check stubs, and it's done. They're going to just go with that. But when it's self-employed, it adds this whole layer of complexity to the residential mortgage underwriting process. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's so true. And before I uh, fully transitioned out of my, uh, um, last corporate job and, um, finally made the, the official leap from employed entrepreneur, um, we, uh, we took out a home equity loan. And uh, I made sure that we did that before, before making the leap, because I knew once that that was it, I, I was going to need two years of records, right? Which is, you know, once you're, once you're an entrepreneur, good luck getting a loan if you don't have two years of history. So before you transition, get your loans now, refinance now, get your home equity uh, line of credit now to put yourself in a position. And this is one of the things that, you know, I, I teach my clients is you got to strategize. Sometimes people, I've had clients where they're like, I'm going to put in my two weeks notice. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. We got a plan. We got to have a strategy. I get that you're fed up and you're frustrated. We got to be smart. You make emotional decisions like that and you don't realize what the consequence of those decisions are. So another, uh, another uh, topic that I think is very important and something that going back to my financial advising and uh, banking days is entrepreneurs really struggle with retirement planning. And I think it's a combination of a couple things. I think one, people in general aren't great at retiring planning, retirement planning when they're an employee. Uh, so there's just an overall intimidation, lack of knowledge. But two, people have no idea what's even out there from an, a business owner perspective. And oftentimes, the plans are even more attractive than if someone's a W-2 employee when you start to think about something like a SEP IRA and how much you can actually contribute. Can you talk about uh, kind of... Uh, uh, business retirement plans and the, from the role of how your company might help uh, your clients in kind of strategizing and figuring out the options, how much they can contribute, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of using your self-employed business as a, as a vehicle to accelerate your retirement savings. Um and so, uh, again, when you're a corporate W-2, you can participate in the, in the company 401k plan. And, you know, depending on your age, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're less than 50 years of age in that context, you can put away 19,500 from your paycheck. Um, and you, uh, and then the company usually has some sort of, um, uh, employer contribution, whether it's a match or a safe Harbor or a profit sharing or any combination of it. Um, but, uh, you have that you have that option to have a to have a self employed four hundred one k plan for your business as well for your self employed business, um, but you also have much more discretion over the employer contribution that you can put in. So I mean there are so um, you know depending on the industry uh, like for example I use I'll use service industry as an example. Now this doesn't mean that retirement plans don't apply to um, brick and mortar retail, but um, more, you know, a service industry is more of an example of where, like, if you're crushing it, right? Like, um, if you're a real estate agent, or if you're, you know, if, if you're a franchise consultant, or if you're a business broker, if you're, if you're, you know, um, if you're an expense reduction analyst, right? Like for one of those brands, like a Schooley Mitchell, um, or um, a, a P3, I'm just like dropping some like franchise brands out there, like any sort of service industry, if you're, you know, if you're in home inspection, um, service like in, compared to brick and mortar retail where you might have capital expenditures where you can do accelerated depreciation a service industry you you may be in a situation where you made all this money you made all this money which is good and you wrote off all your expenses 
right? And maybe you even accelerated some of your expenses from Q1 of next year, right? Like you're in Q4 and you're like, holy crap, I just had this great year. Well, like, well, let me prepay some of my 2022 expenses, you know, to chop down this prop. But like you do all that and you, you're still looking at this huge profit. What else can you do? You get to the point, you know, you can't buy this huge piece of machinery because it doesn't really make sense, you know, for like a real estate agent to like uh, have a huge piece of machinery. Like if you, you know, as opposed to like if you were like a manufacturing company, what do I, I just, I did everything I could. I still have this monster profit. That's, you know, re self-employed retirement strategy, self-employed retirement strategy and make massive contributions to your self-employed retirement plan. So uh, have a self-employed 401k and do the full deferral, you know, can you justify your spouse being involved in the business at all? If so, if you can justify it, you know, uh, put, uh, put him or her on the payroll and, and can, max can, them. Yeah. can you give an, sorry to interrupt you. Can you give yeah. an, an, a, an idea? Cause I think people are going to be blown away by this. Can you give an idea of what type of level of contributions people can make to these plans? Oh yeah. So, I mean, if it's a 401k for, if it's a, if it's a 401k, then you can do I'm assuming that you're under, like if the person's under 50, they can do 19.5 out of their paycheck. If they're over 50, they can do an additional 6,000. So, so 25.5 out of their paycheck, but then they also can do ballpark, you know, 25% of their salary as an employer profit sharing contribution. And, and so there, it changes each year for inflation, but the, like a, a total, a max 401k for someone under 50 in 2021 is approximately 58 thousand dollars so that means that if you were to but and you would have to take a salary of approximately 130 140 thousand but still i mean like the more salary that you take you're you're paying more money that's you know subject to 15.3 percent social security medicare tax but then you're also able to put more dollars away and shelter them from income tax which depending on which state you're in federal and state may be well above 32 percent like it may, it may be even tipping 40 percent if you're in a state like california new york or, or illinois um, and, um, and so, but yeah, like you could potentially put away up to 50 grand, like 58,000, you know, if you take a salary of approximately 130 from your business and that's huge. And then it gets you, it doesn't stop there. You know, you could potentially put in what's called a defined, like if you have enough free cash flow from your business, uh, and then you, then you can stack what's called a defined benefit plan on top of your 401k. So a 401k plan is the most commonly known plan that's considered a defined contribution plan. And then there are these plans that are called defined benefit plans, which are pension plans. And a, a common one is called a cash balance plan. And a cash balance plan allows you to put away, you know, it's based off of like these like complex actuarial tables, and it allows you to put away a, a, an extra chunk of change into like a, a, and, and like it depends on how much you 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 um you set the limit for but you could potentially put another you know 30 50 70 100k on top of the 401 it's massive and then you can put provisions in both the 401k plan and the cash balance plan that allow you to make a chunk of your uh contributions as roth as opposed to pre-tax so you can because the uh the roth the, the regular roth ira Number one, if you're less than uh, 50 years of age, you can only put away 6,000 per year. And, but if you are, um, but depending on how much money you make, you may not even be able to qualify to put money into a Roth IRA. Now there's a work around that for the Roth IRA called a backdoor Roth, which you pretty much, you, you make a non-deductible IRA contribution and then immediately roll it over into the Roth, but still you're only limited to 6,000 a year to do that. And so uh, there are ways that you can make large Roth contributions in, inside the, the self-employed retirement plans, you know, 401ks, cash balance plans, they don't just have to be pre-tax. And, um, and, and, and with all that being said, so I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of every, like, so for example, for myself, I'm 34 years old and every year me and my wife, we max out our IRAs and we max out our 401ks, both salary deferral and as much as profit sharing as possible. And, um, and, you know, uh, uh, like I plan on in the, in the next couple of years, stacking a cash balance plan on top of it. And just, you know, because like, for example, my, my brother is a Chicago police officer. So he's got a nice pension waiting for him as he gets into his fifties and sixties. I don't. So I have to make my own, but, uh, but because of, you know, but, but by going heavy on self-employed retirement plan strategy at this, you know, at 34, as opposed, you know, to just getting around to it at 50. And, and by the way, you know, like, you know, there's, there's no time like the present. So if you haven't done it up until now, regardless of what age you are, start, but 
Um, you know, it's a real in-depth conversation, Tarek, and you can tell I'm passionate about it, but there is so much there to uh, like when it comes to using your business as a vehicle through which to accelerate your retirement savings through life. Because you can yeah. do so much more compared to if you were just a W-2 employee at a job. Yeah. yeah. Man, that was, uh, that was epic. I mean, I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm leaning uh, uh, on the edge of my seat here because it's such an exciting topic for me, especially as someone who... Uh, has had their investment licenses for uh, for 14 years now. Just the overall retirement topic, man. I mean, as an entrepreneur, it's just it's epic. And the fact that someone, if their business is doing well enough, profiting enough, that you can put aside fifty plus thousand dollars a year towards your retirement. I mean, wow! And that's money that you're not paying taxes on that you're able to defer towards your later years when hopefully, or maybe not, it would be a quality problem if your tax bracket didn't, didn't reduce in retirement. That means you're still, you're still making a lot of money. So that, that's what I would call a, uh, a quality problem. But I think this is such a massive topic and we didn't plan to cover this topic, but I'm so glad we did. And, and obviously Mike is, uh, is a true expert to be able to just drop bombs like that off the cuff on, uh, on retirement plans, but I think, uh, I think we'll leave it there, Mike, because I think that that's a really exciting topic to, uh, to cap off and, and finish off with. So for, um, for everyone out there that that's watched this, um, uh, Mike, where can, um, everyone follow you or get in touch with you if they wanted to set up that free consultation call or just kind of keep track of, uh, of the content and, and information that you provide. Absolutely. So uh, I am my main social media presence is on LinkedIn. So find me on LinkedIn, send me a connection request, Michael Ian Reader. My middle name is Ian I A N. So Michael Ian Reader, LinkedIn, send me a connection request. Would love to connect there. Um, uh, my company website, Swartz and Reader Advisors. So swartzreader.com, S W A R T Z R E E D E R.com. Uh, my, my email address, send me an email, my first and last name, Michael reader at swartzreader.com. So you can just, you know, if, if you're listening to this, if you're watching it, you can play it back, but it's Michael reader at swartzreader.com. Again, that's S W A R T Z R E E D E R.com. My business phone is eight, four, seven, two, four, one, five, eight, zero, zero extension two. And my cell phone eight, four, seven, three zero two three three nine seven on that cell phone you can call me you can text me and just you know if you need to hear any of that just play it back uh and i'm here reach out to me would love to connect with you and um uh if you're if you're if you're coming from Tarek's ecosystem then that makes me really excited to listen to 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 to, to get to know you uh, because I've, I've known Tarek for a few months now and and, and Tarek it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you are doing great things in the business, in the business, in, in the business resale and franchise space, um, you know, helping aspiring entrepreneurs, helping current business owners thriving. Uh, uh, your, 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 your YouTube presence is amazing. So thank you, Tarek, for all the value that you provide the, the ecosystem here um, and keep doing great things. Awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, brother. All right, guys. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap. And uh, let's make sure to uh, to get your money and finances in order and uh, make sure to uh, to reach out to Mike. We'll see you guys on the next one. 